this will ultimately this will ultimately change everything about your future and you'll enjoy you will enjoy living for the Lord and you'll have a wonderful life First of all, so you're in Romans chapter 6, right? Look at chapter 7. And I'm going to read something to you that, as we read it, you might seem a little confused. But then I want you to consider if this is kind of the way your life is. Okay, so this is Paul talking, and this is what Paul says. Look at Romans chapter 7, and look at verse 15. This is such a fun chapter to read right here because it is so confusing. Are you ready? Verse 15. For that which I do, I allow not. For what I would, that do I not. But what I hate, that do I. If then I do that which I would not, I consent unto the law that it is good. Now then it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. For I know that in me that is in my flesh dwelleth no good thing. For to will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good, I find not. For the good that I would, I do not, but the evil which I would not, that I do. Now, if I do that I would not, it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. What? Let's read that again. Let's look at verse 19. Ready? For the good that I would, I do not, but the evil which I would not, that I do. Now, if I do that I would not, it is not I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. And try to say that five times fast. Then he says in verse number 22, for I delight in the law of God after the inward man, but I see another law in my members warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity of the law of sin, which is in my members. O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord, so then with the mind I myself serve the law of God, but, after, but with the flesh the law of sin. Now, this is what Paul said right here. He said, in a very tongue-tying way, he said, the things that I want to do for God, I don't do. The things that I don't want to do in sin, I do. The good that I want to do, I don't do it. And the things that I hate, I do. Now, let's be honest for a minute. How many of us would say, Brother Miller, I know exactly what he's talking about. There are things I want to do for God, and then I end up not doing them. There are sins that I, I don't want to commit, and then I end up doing that. And every time, I regret it. How many of you would say, that's me? All right, I mean, the Apostle Paul admitted it, so I think we all can. So how many of you would say, that's me? The things I want to do, I don't. The things I don't want to do. I mean, how many times have we come to an altar and said, oh, Lord, I want to read my Bible every day. Help me read my Bible. I want to do that. And then the next day, I mean, you're all prepared. You get your Bible on the nightstand. You set your alarm. You're going to read your Bible. You've got this in your mind. You've already imagined it. You've already said, Lord, help me read my Bible in the morning. In your mind, you've got it imagined. The alarm clock's going to go off. There's going to be Gabriel and Michael, the archangels, on your bed, and they're going to be like, whoa. You're going to wake up. The light's going to fill the room with glory. The Bible's going to open up. The Holy Spirit's going to begin to speak to you. You're going to have this amazing time with God, and you are going to walk around with, like, this big halo around your head, and you're just going to have this power of God, and you know I'm going to walk with God in the morning, and then reality is, and eh, and eh, and. Eh. <sighs> And you are snoring while your alarm's going off, right? And you're making this drool rainbow on your pillow, and your Bible's over there all crinkled up and never opened. And you get up in the morning late, and your mom's like, you're late for school. And you're having another rushed morning, and you're like, oh, man, I really wanted to read my Bible today. I'm such an idiot. Anybody ever had a morning like that? I remember one time I decided, bless God, I heard a guy preach on prayer one time. Man, I said, I'm going to pray. I'm going to pray. Tomorrow morning, I'm going to get up. I'm going to walk with God. I'm going to pray for one hour. I did, man. I made a commitment. Lord, I'm going to pray for an hour. I mean, Jesus said, what? Could you not watch with me for one hour? I'm watching for one hour. I got up the next, man, I went home that night after church. I cleaned out part of my closet because I thought, man, you got to go in your closet to pray. And my closet was tiny. So I got cleaned out. I pulled out shoes. I pushed everything to one side. The next morning, I got in my closet, and I'm like in this little tiny space, right? I mean, I'm crammed in, and I'm like, okay, I'm getting cramping up, Lord. I'm going to move to a bigger spot. So I got out, man, I get over by my chair, and I'm praying. And I'm going to pray for an hour. Man, I prayed. Listen, I prayed for my mom and dad. I prayed for the church. I prayed for our missionaries. I prayed around the world. I prayed for everything I could think of. And I'm like, yes, five minutes? Are you kidding me? 
So I'm like, okay. So then I started praying for him again. And I mean, I'm praying for everything. And I'm looking at my clock, and it's like three minutes goes by. I'm, I'm like eight minutes in, and I got nothing. The next thing I know is my, I had set a timer for an hour. The timer's going off, and I went from meditation to meditation. I am like <laughs> passed out. And I just heard the Holy Spirit like, what? You couldn't watch with me for 10 minutes? It was eight minutes. You ever been there? You ever, you ever told the Lord, Lord, I'm sorry for that sin that does so easily beset me, and you, you try to give that sin up, you confess it, and then, I mean, before the day's even over. And then you feel like an idiot. You ever done that? How many of you say, okay, Brother Miller, I know what you're talking about. Paul said, the things I would do, I don't do. The things that I hate, that's what I do. Well, let me tell you something right now. That is not, now everybody listen to me real, real quick, that is not the normal Christian life. I know many of us think that's the normal Christian life, but it's not the way it's supposed to be. We are not supposed to be living as a Christian as losers. Jesus did not save you to be a loser. Jesus Christ saved you so that you could, he caused us always to triumph in Christ. In all things, we are more than what? We are more than what? Conquerors. Let's all say it together. In all things, we are more than then listen, Jesus saved us to be victorious. He saved us to win. He did not save us to live in constant defeat. But some of us as Christians get in this idea, well, I'm just human. And so we buy into this thing that we're not perfect. And so sometimes we fail and sometimes we don't get to do what we want to do. And I really tried to do that for God, but it just didn't work out. I mean, I tried to overcome that sin, but I'm just weak. You know, I'm just a human. And the trouble is, that's so true because we are just human. But there is something about our salvation that Satan wants to keep you ignorant of. And so I'm going to put three words very quickly on your mind so that you can have victory over sin. Look back at chapter 6. Here we go. Chapter 6. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? What's the next two words? Verse 2. Everybody read it out loud. What is the next two words? God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? So here's what Paul's saying. Paul's saying, hey, I know that many people are thinking that because we're saved by grace, I mean, we're all just sinners, so we're just going to, you know, it's okay. We, you know, we're all sinners. We're going to just fail. We're going to sin. And Paul said, wait a minute. How shall we that are dead to sin remain in sin? We're dead to sin. Now let's say that, Let's say that today we, we all just took a little field trip real quick up to the local mortuary. What's the, what's the nearest funeral home, Brother Kramer? Huh? Wood fence? Pfft, that's a weird name. Wood fence. Hey, do you know why they're building fences around cemeteries now? Because people are dying to get in. <laughs> so anyway. So. Hey, stop it. So let's say we all run up to wood fence and we sneak in, and we grab a casket with somebody in it. And we load it up in the back of a pickup. Who's got a pickup? We, who, what's your name? Colt. We put it in Colt's pickup, right? <laughs> so there we got this beautiful casket. We get it in the back of his pickup. We're driving along. We get up a big hill, and all of a sudden, the casket slides out the back of the truck, and it's rolling down the highway. Zips all the way through the intersection. These cars are all swerving. That casket, like, bounces over the curb, flies down. Like, everybody sees this thing. Like, all of a sudden, the news media's out there filming it. That casket goes flying all the way down. It hits a fence. The door opens up. The body comes flying out on the ground. And the last thing you hear the body say when it passes by is, anybody got anything to stop this coffin? I'm just kidding. So, did you get it? So we get it in the back of Cole's pickup truck, all right? So we got the coffin, and we bring it up here, and we open it up, and we read the little mortuary card, and there's this guy in there. He's just laying there. And we look at the mortuary card, and his name is Harold. And we're like, hey, we just snatched the body of Harold. Harold Doolittle. Here he is right here. And we got this casket up here, right? And so we're like, what are we going to do with him? I'm like, I don't know. So somebody gets an idea. And they walks up here, and they pitch in the casket a six-pack of beer. 
And they're like, hey, Harold, let's drink it up, bro. It's the last day, that, man. This is our last shindig. Let's go. Let's drink. How many of those beers is Harold going to drink? Huh? How many? At least one? How many is Harold going to drink? None. Why? So then we're like, whoa, whoa. Well, hey, man, here. And we, we throw in, we throw in some, some marijuana and we say, hey, here, let's smoke some marijuana and just, and just have one more party. How many of those is he going to smoke? He's going to smoke none. You know why? He is. Then all of a sudden, somebody over here, over here says, hey, wait a minute. Is that Harold Doolittle? Yeah. Man, that guy owes me a thousand bucks, that bum. He was going to pay me back, and then he woes up and dies. Walks up there, grabs a hold of Harold, picks him up. You no good liar and cheat. You're a no good nothing. Punches him right in the face. Now, what's Harold's reaction going to be? Is he going to fight with that guy? No, why not? So then somebody else walks up and just starts cussing him. You're a no good blankety blank. Is he going to cuss him back? Why? Then somebody walks up to him and, and, uh, and tries, to, tries to give him a, a, a bunch of money and bribe him off to, hey, I, uh, uh, Harold, I wanna, I wanna, I'm going to give you some money, man, if you'll, if you'll do me a favor. Is he going to take it? Why? Hey, Harold, I want you to look at this. I want you to look at this website. Tell me what you think about that. Tell me what you think about my Instagram post. I want you to, is he going to look at it? Why not? So I think many of us would be really surprised if Harold sat up. And he's like, hey, let's party. I think everybody would clear the room. My brothers one time, when they were little, I wasn't alive yet, but my brothers, when they were little, they went to the funeral home with my dad. He was going to preach a funeral. My brothers went to the funeral home, and my oldest brother's very mischievous. He's terrible. He took my little brother, my brother Matt, they were like, they were like maybe 10 and 7 years old, and he snuck them in the back room, and they were looking at some of the bodies in there. Well, my, my brother Matt is very tender, and he got freaked out. So he ran to the bathroom, and he's hiding there. My brother's in there trying to get him out, and my brother's afraid. My oldest brother's afraid that my mom and dad are going to find out what they did because Matt's so freaked out, and he's going to get in trouble. So he's like trying to calm him down. He's like, calm down, Matt, calm down. When through the door comes one of those dead guys, walks in the bathroom, and he looks at my brothers, and my brother freaks out. They're trying to climb behind the toilet. They are screaming. My dad comes running in there. What is going on? And my brothers are in sheer panic. One of the guys that died had a twin brother. <laughs> and the twin brother, true, true story, twin brother walks in the bathroom and scared my brothers to death. Now, let me tell you something. If a dead guy sat up out of the casket, I don't care how cool you think you are. If a dead guy sat out of the casket, you're going to freak out. And yet, here we are in this room right now, and some of you are perpetually, continually living in sin. And the mildest temptation comes along, and you fall, and you give in. And we think nothing about it. And yet you're dead. And temptation should have no power over you. So I'm going to give you three words. Here we go. Number one, what is the first word of verse three? Say it out loud. What's the first word of verse three? First word of verse six. First word of verse nine. Knowing. So the first word is you have to know. K-N-O-W. You need to know. God said, I want you to know that you are dead with Jesus Christ. I want you to know that when Jesus died on the cross, you died with him. And when he was buried, your old man was buried with him. Look at verse number four. Therefore, we are buried with, with him by baptism into his death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should what? Walk in newness of life our old man was dead and our new man is to walk in a new life in jesus christ now listen to me young people listen to me the devil wants you to be ignorant the bible says 
Paul said it over and over again. I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren. I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren. I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren. And one of the things that Satan wants to do is he wants to keep us ignorant. The Bible says in the book of 2 Corinthians and chapter 1, Paul said, we are not ignorant of his devices. Satan wants to keep us in ignorance. He wants to keep us in darkness so that we don't know that we are dead. If we don't know, we cannot act on, on what we don't know. If you don't know something, you can't do anything about it. Uh, I can only make decisions as good as the information that I have. If I don't have all the information, I can't make a good decision. And God said, I want you to know this. I want you to know that you're dead. I want you to know that you have a new life. I want you to know that the old man is dead. He said, I want you in verse number six, look at verse six. I want you to know that your old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth, that means from now on, we should not serve sin. We have a generation of Christians today that are in bondage to sin because they don't know that they're dead. You need to know it. You need to know that even though, listen to me, you don't have to understand it. I know that the sun gives off heat and I know that the sun gives light. Okay? I don't understand how it all works. Like, I don't understand how it doesn't burn out. The sun is always burning constantly. How does it not burn out? I don't understand it, but I don't care if I understand it. I got to know it. Uh, how many of you drove your own car to school? Okay, you drove your own car to school. You drove your own car to school? What kind of car do you have? A Honda Civic. How many cylinders? You don't know what a cylinder is? Um, um. What, what, kind of, um, what kind of torque does it have? Okay. Does anybody know how much torque their car had when you came here? Does anybody know what a cylinder is? Does anybody know what a valve is? Does anybody know? Does anybody know what, what the, tra do you know what the transmission is? What, what's the transmission? This is going to be great. What's the transmission? It makes your car go. The transmission makes your car go. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. You're doing really good. But here, you know what's awesome? You know what's awesome? You drove your car here because you knew how to drive. You didn't have to understand how it all works. You didn't have to understand how it works. I mean, that's what most of us say. You know, people in the Christian life, well, I just, uh, I don't understand how God could be one God, three persons, and I don't understand how the Bible could be written by a bunch of people all the way through the years and still be a perfect Bible, and I don't understand how, uh, how all this stuff got here because God just spoke it in existence. I don't know how, uh, how Jesus could have died 2,000 years ago, and that affects my life today. People want to understand all the stuff they don't even understand. You don't have to understand how all that works. You just have to know it. You have to know that God made this world. You have to know that God is who he says he is. You have to know that the Bible is true. You have to know that Jesus died on the cross for you. You have to know that he carried your sins away. You have to know that he was buried and rose again from the dead. And you put your faith in that. And guess what? You arrive at your destination. All you did this morning is you walked out, you knew that you had to put that little sticky thing in that other thing and you had to turn it. And then you had to move the round thing back and forth while you were pushing the pedal on the right. Sometimes you need to use the pedal on the left. And then I have to push that other stick down that makes that little clicky thing go click, 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 click. Right? It's called a blinker. You don't have to understand how your car works, you just drive it. You don't have to understand how salvation works. You just have to know it does. That your old man, Paul said this. Paul said, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. Can you explain that? No, I can't explain it, but I believe it and I know it. Okay, so everybody say this. You need to know that you're dead to sin. Ready, say that. I, 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 know, I know that I'm dead to sin. Ready? I know that I'm dead to sin. Say that again. I Know that I'm dead to sin. And then you need to say this. I know that I'm alive in Christ. I want you to say that. Ready? I know that I'm alive in Christ. You need to know it. Number two. This is a great southern word. Verse number 11. Likewise, reckon. You see that? See the word reckon? Likewise, reckon ye also yourselves dead into sin. Now, in the south, when we say reckon, we, we mean we suppose or maybe. Is it going to rain tomorrow? I reckon. Um, hey, is, uh, is there going to be church tonight? Well, I reckon so. Now, that's what it means. But that's not what it means in the Bible. In the Bible, the word reckon is an accounting term. It's called reconcile. 
If you have a bank account, you have to reconcile what's in your bank and what's in your checkbook or whatever. You know, I know you don't use checks anymore. I don't either. But you have to reconcile your account. You have to make sure that you're not spending more than what's in there. That's the key. And you have to reconcile. And God said this, I want you to reckon. Look at verse 11. Look at it. Likewise, reckon ye also yourselves to be dead unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ. He said, in other words, I want you like an accountant to know, to know that you're dead to sin and to know that you're alive to Christ, that God has made this deposit into your account. Now you need to reconcile that and put that in the account so that you can spend it. Look, if I came to you and I said, hey, I'm going to give you, Gabby, I'm going to give you a million dollars. You're like, yes. And you knew that I was a seriously wealthy guy. Like I had my own planes and my own business. You knew that I had the million dollars. And I called you up and said, hey, listen, I just, I want to give you a million bucks. You would be so pumped because you knew that I had it. And you knew that what I told you was true, that I was going to give you a million bucks. You would be so pumped. But here's the problem. If you never put that money in the bank, it would do you no good. You have to reconcile that. You have to reconcile it. So when Jesus said, I died for you, and in that you died, so sin doesn't rule over you anymore. And I rose again for you, so now you can have a new life. You need to put that in your bank every day. You need to deposit that into your life. You need to reckon your life with that. You need to bring your life into a reconciliation. You need to put that into your account and say, you know what? I'm dead today to sin. Sin has no power over me, and I'm alive in Jesus Christ. So the life that I live is going to be lived by Jesus Christ today. I don't understand how all that works, but I know it works, and I'm going to reconcile that. And the third thing is this. Look at verse number 12. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal bodies that ye should obey it in the lust thereof. Neither, what's the next word? Say it out loud. Verse 13, neither your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto God, but, uh, unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. So the first word is you need to know that you're dead to sin and that you're alive to Christ. Second thing is you need to reconcile that. You need to reckon that in your life, that Jesus Christ died for you, he rose again for you, and that you have power and victory over sin. Put that into your life. Tomorrow, when you wake up in the morning, or even throughout the whole day today, when you come to temptation, you need to look at that temptation and you need to say, hey, I have deposited into my bank the life of Jesus Christ. So I'm going to not let the old man answer the door of this sin. I'm going to let Christ answer the door of this sin. When somebody is tempting you, when there is a temptation in front of you, you send Jesus to the door to answer it. That's how you reconcile. And what you do then is you yield your members to God. So it's simple. Did Jesus die on the cross for you, yes or no? Yes or no? And when he died supernaturally, did you die with him? Yes or no? Yeah, you did. When he rose from the dead, did you rise from the dead? Yes or no? Yes. So the old man is dead. Do you know that? I didn't ask you if you understand it, but do you know it? Now you need to live that way. You need to reconcile that. You need to put that power to work in your life. And you say, okay, Lord, that's what you did for me. I'm putting that to my test. So if it's, if it's, a, if it's a, a, a TV program, if it's a website, if it's a, if it's a friend, if it's music, if whatever temptation, if it's lust, if it's lying, whatever temptation, I'm going to put the life of Christ in the middle of that temptation, and I'm going to let Jesus Christ have victory over that. Do you know that Jesus was tempted in all points as we are, yet without sin? It is not a sin to be tempted. Jesus was tempted just like you're tempted, yet he didn't sin. So how do you overcome sin? When temptation knocks, you send Jesus to the door to answer it. And you ask Jesus, Jesus, I want to know if you want to look at this website. And he's going to say, of course not. So then you do not yield your members to the sin. You yield your members to Christ. You yield yourselves instruments. You see, that piano over there is an instrument, right? Is there anybody in here who can play the piano really well? Huh? Anybody play the piano real well? Who? You can play the piano real well? All right, come here. Bring it. Hurry. Je hey, Jesus is coming. Let's go. He's coming at any minute. Right now is a piano playoff right now. All right? Come on. We're, you and I are going at it right here. Sit down right there at that piano. All right? 
Okay, so now I'm going to give you about 30 seconds. You play the best thing you got. Let's go. Yeah, you go ahead. Yeah. Just play something. What you got? How old are you? About to be 13. Man. Are you ready for this contest? Because I know what I'm playing in just a second. So is this thing on? Is there a button for this to be on? It's on the back? Okay, here we go. Ready? Power's on. Go ahead and play. Just 30 seconds. Yeah. I'll count it down. And then I'm going to play 30 seconds. I think I can do that good. Oh, the volume's not up? Oh, there it goes. Okay, here we go. Okay, wait, okay, hold on just one second real quick. Does anybody else not see Bugs Bunny running around right now? Like, that's all I can see in my mind is Bugs Bunny. Okay, go ahead. That was amazing. Keep going. I got to hear some more of that. Okay, that's good. That's good. Is that the best you got? All right, let's give him a hand right here. Okay. Now, I know, hey, wait, wait, wait a minute. I want you to stand right here because this, this is going to be amazing. Was that Chopin? Who was that, Beethoven? Beethoven? Is that Beethoven's fourth? What was it? Oh, okay. All right, here you go, ready? Yes. Okay, so who thinks he's the winner? Who thinks I'm the winner? Do you understand what this is? This is a great hymn. Listen to this. It goes, I, I dropped my dolly in the dirt. I asked her if it really hurt. And all my dolly said to me was, wow, 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 wow. That is beautiful. Now, listen. I was better. And you're very kind. Come here for just a second. Now watch this. That piano is an instrument. A second ago, come here, it yielded to his members. And it played Beethoven. It yielded to my, and it played, I dropped my dolly in the dirt. That piano has the capacity to play concerts beautiful classical, or it can play chopsticks. It's only going to yield its members to whoever's sitting at the piano. And see, what some of you need to know is this. You need to know that Jesus Christ, when he saved you, now sits at the piano. And you need to reckon your life with that, and you need to let him play, and you yield your members to what he wants to play. And when he does that, your life will play beautiful music. Some of you are selling your life out too cheaply. And you're letting sin play, I dropped my dolly in the dirt. And you're going to sell your life cheaply because you yielded your members to it. So I want to put three words in your heart. Know that Jesus Christ, when he died, you died. You're dead to sin. Know that when he rose again, you're alive to God. Now reconcile your life. Let him sit down at the piano of your life and let him play and yield your members. Yield your hands, yield your eyes, yield your feet, yield your mind to the Lord Jesus Christ. Not my will, but thine be done. And he'll play the song. And man, what a beautiful life. You can have power over sin. You do not have to live in chapter 7 
of what I want to do, I don't do, and what I don't want to do, I do. You can live a life of victory. Amen? Let's bow for prayer. Father, I thank you so much.